Hello, everyone. Welcome to Metcalf Institute's 24th Annual Public Lecture Series. I am Sunshine Menezes. I'm Metcalf's Executive Director, and we're really glad that you've joined us to kick off this year's series. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We approach this goal holistically, offering science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from across the country to make science communication more inclusive and equitable. The next Inclusive SciComm Symposium will be held virtually this coming October, and we urge you to learn more about that by visiting the link in the chat. As I noted, this is our 24th annual public lecture series. We have traditionally offered this series in person at the University of Rhode Island, but that changed last year when we had to pivot all of our programming to a virtual setting. One silver lining of this experience is that we will continue to provide these lectures as a live stream in future years, even when we can safely gather together in person again. So keep your eyes open for that. We shaped this year's lecture series to focus on efforts to study and implement equitable climate change solutions. Climate change is already having starkly disproportionate impacts on low wealth communities and communities of color around the world. These inequities have inspired a range of innovative solutions that involve partnerships between communities, researchers, government agencies, nonprofits, and the, public, the private sector. Over the course of this week, we'll hear from experts in science, journalism, and policy who are actively centering equity in their efforts to address climate change. Their specific solutions vary, including grassroots organizing, technology, applied research, and strategies for reporting on climate change. As ever, we expect that you will hear new and provocative ideas during this year's lectures. So without further ado, let's get started. The late President John F. Kennedy famously said that anyone who can solve the problems of water will be worthy of two Nobel Prizes, one for peace and one for science. This statement made more than 60 years ago is perhaps more applicable today than ever in a world where water scarcity is a growing threat due to drastic changes in our climate and increasing pollution. Per the theme of this week's lecture series, Water availability and quality reflect one of the most longstanding and immediately pressing environmental justice concerns. The effects of changes in our water supply are disproportionately affecting already marginalized communities. To solve this multifaceted problem, we must consider creative policies and actions to ensure sustainable and just access to our most essential resource. Today, we are grateful to gain new insights on these issues from an international authority in urban water management, Dr. Nusha Ajami, Director of Urban Water Policy and a Senior Research Associate at the Stanford University Woods Institute for the Environment. As an interdisciplinary hydrologist and a widely recognized leader in water research, she specializes in sustainable water resource management, water policy, the water energy food nexus, which we'll hear more about today, and developing techniques to address the uncertainties involved in water management. Dr. Ajami aims to improve relationships between scientists, stakeholders, and policymakers by emphasizing interdisciplinary and impact-driven research to identify solutions to the problems we face in urban water management. Along with a long list of publications, contributions, contributions to major media outlets, and teaching appointments, Dr. Ajami is committed to engaging in local, regional, and national efforts to improve water management. To this end, she has served on national advisory boards with the National Research Council and the National Academy's Board on Water Science and Technology, and she's a gubernatorial appointee to the Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board in California. Ajami's current position as Director of Urban Water Policy with Stanford's Water in the West program has allowed her to lead education and engagement initiatives, solutions-focused research, and strategic partnerships to answer questions about how the American West can respond to the present and future challenges of water scarcity. Today, Dr. Jami will give us a small snapshot of her work and some ideas for how to equitably approach the intersections of water scarcity, food, and energy. Very pleased to hand the mic over to Dr. Nusha Jami. Thank you so much, Sunshine. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna share my screen. Perfect, there we go. 
Um, it is truly a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, really excited about this lecture series and uh, lots of great talks coming for the rest of the week. Hopefully I can start off this discussion on some interesting and some concerning issues around how we approach water management. Um, today I'm going to talk about the trade-offs across the water energy food nexus uh, and uh, in more details, we discuss a triple bottom line sustainability assessment that we developed to understand the impact of desalination in the San Quentin Valley in Mexico. Okay, let's see. Oh, perfect. Okay. Just for those of you who might not be familiar with the location, uh, basically Baja California region is connected to the uh, the the south the southern part of California into Mexico and there uh, and a lot of the agricultural activity in Mexico happens there. Um, the area we focused on for this specific study was the San Quentin Valley, which actually includes uh, sort of overlays four different aquifers and, um, and grows a lot of different uh, agricultural products that some of them actually ends up in our plates in the US. There are so many agribusinesses that actually have, um, uh, that are sort of um, housed in the US, but they grow their products there, including berries, um, tomatoes, onions, cucumbers, just name it. And, um, and this region actually has been sort of a part of this process since the 30s. There was the agricultural practices there by the 1970s um, because of the interest in exporting the products. Uh, there was a lot of focus in this region. Uh, the earlier time, uh, the agricultural activities uh, were not as much um, uh, fruitful because of the because of lack of water and also uh, poor quality of the soil. And eventually, when the, by the seventies, there was a realization that these products can be exported to the U.S. Uh, uh, the, and actually exported outside of the region. There was a lot more interest. Um, then uh, drip irrigation came about and also fertilization to improve the quality of the soil. And, um, and this story that I'm going to tell you and the study we have done sort of starts from that process. I'll talk, about, I'll talk about a little bit about the motivation and background of this study, the uh, analysis we developed and some of the conclusions and ideas. So let me walk you through the puzzle that we were trying to solve for the study. So San Quentin Aquifer is only source of uh, fresh water in that region. And um, they have been, because of agricultural practices, there have been a serious overdraft of this aquifer and lots of seawater intrusion. So these aquifers that are close to the ocean, when you start taking fresh water out, eventually the seawater starts and starts filling out this um, uh, filling out the space uh, that was um, that was created by taking the fresh water out, and eventually this this is called seawater intrusion, and eventually can impact the water quality and availability of uh, water in the region. Um, basically, there about because of this salty water and seawater intrusion about 54 privately owned desalination plant has been built between 1998 and 2016 by agribusinesses. Basically, they have built these desalination plants in their farms to deal with the, uh, with the salty water since they can grow these crops with salty water. And then these desalination plants actually has um, uh, sort of um, um, are basically drawing water from these aquifers and then um, uh, uh, taking the salt out and then the, this water is used for agricultural practices and there is no actual um, the groundwater recharge activity happening there um, or any other environmental concern about how this kind of uh, overdraft of aquifer can impact the people and the environment over time. So the question is why desalination and what's the cost benefit of desalination? I'm sure a lot of you have heard, um, you know, there are some thoughts out there that desalination is the panacea. It's going to help us to deal with our uh, water, limited water availability, and it can potentially solve some of our scarcity problems. Um, one of the reasons we focused on this area was actually this is the 
uh, area that has been trying to depend on the desalination as a way of overcoming its limitation. And some of the social, economic, and environmental impact of this practice is quite obvious and has already been sort of causing a lot of issues. So uh, we thought this region is sort of like a, uh, can spotlight some of the things that we have to pay attention to and also the reality of what's, what, fo what kind of a technological focus can potentially help us in the long run or can actually hurt us in the long run. So the triple bottom line, um, as you see, this is a beautiful picture of the San Quentin Valley and um, uh, the greenhouses um, that, um, um, that are being used to, uh, to grow, pro uh, produce. Um, the triple bottom line analysis we did focused on environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and social sustainability. Um, so uh, we used, um, uh, we sort of mismatched a bunch of um, uh, data sources to do this study. Obviously, it's not easy. So this is a very complex study. Um, we had to sort of rely on a lot of publicly available data and also some secondary, some other secondary data that were available in from uh, that they're available to some of our co cool, uh, authors in this paper that were not necessarily public. Uh, from well permits to socio some socio demographic uh, census data, some of the ethnographic research that has been already done. So we, we did a lot of literature search to get data out, uh, agricultural production and pricing data that was available um, uh, uh, to some of our authors, and hydrologic surveys, electric electricity grid and emission data, some of the wage and employment statistics and also some of the infra infrastructure documentation for us to be on to better understand the desalination projects uh, and some of the environmental impact reports that has been done and what were the sort of like a, a foresight of how they would impact um, the region. Um, we also actually collected some, we surveyed um, the operators or some of the owners of these 54 um, 54 well, sorry, desalination plants that uh, we focused on. Uh, we developed a survey. Uh, we uh, collaborated with one of the universities in Baja California, and we sent a um, number of students down there to collect the data for us uh, after a visit by, um, by our research uh, uh, staff who were actually the Gemma Smith, who was actually doing their actual work. So she went down there, she did some of the survey and also then uh, subsequently we sent some of the students down there to collect more information um, on these 54 uh, uh, desalination plants. So um, let's focus on those three steps that I mentioned, the environmental sustainability, Basically, the way we defined environmental sustainability uh, was to measure how natural resources basically input and output from the desalination process and how potentially it can accumulate or deplete over time. Um, that's, uh, that can be water, availability, quality, and also some of the uh, greenhouse gas emission um, that uh, can be caused by desalination process. Um, so, just to provide some context on the environmental sustainability. Basically what we did with water quantity, we got the well data and then we basically did some calculations on how much water a desalinated, desalination plant can extract from the, from the wells, considering the fact that uh, they're running on average for 21 hours a day. And uh, we, um, we basically came down to about 27 million um, um, cubic meter of desalinated water per year. And that means that there's not enough water in the, in the um, basically the 27 million is not um, uh, matching the recharge for the aquifers. So basically there, there's about 10 million, um, 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 10, 10 million um, cubic meter of water that is actually being overdrafted it means that um, the, the aquifer is not being recharged for it. So there's always this negative that's hanging over every year of this production that's going on. Um, so, and then for, um, 
for the water quality, it's actually quite interesting. So these aquifers used to be fresh water. And now at this point, some of the highest reported salinity for these aquifers is about 28,000 milligram per liter. That's, that is very high. Um, the, I have the seawater um, sea uh, salinity number here for you to look at, which is about 35,000 um, uh, milligram per liter, which you can see there's not much of a difference and that's still quite a significant amount of uh, salt in the water that needs to be extracted. Uh, one thing that's important to mention is actually what they do is desalinate this water and then they combine it with some undesalinated groundwater because it costs so much money to desalinate water. So they bring the desalinity down and then use that as a way of um, um, irrigating the lands. So on the greenhouse gas emission part, we sort of, the, they, um, um, the, the numbers are between 31,000 to 78,000 tons of um, CO2 uh, per year, which is um, uh, quite significant if you uh, think about it. And um, one of the reasons this has been sort of going on for such a long time, and you might ask, how is it possible that um, they are using so much uh, energy, this, um, you know, emit so much CO2 and impact, having so much impact on water? And the reason is there is a tariff on electricity for these agribusinesses. So the cost of electricity for them is quite insignificant. And um, at this point, is very, it's a very small amount of their, um, the cost of their, um, um, their revenue process, one to 2%. And that's why it makes it, uh, it justifies the action of doing desalination for, for irrigation. Um, this number is quite more significant other places. Electricity uh, is biggest part of the desalination, cost of desalination process. Okay, so the next part of the sustainability at the trip and bottom line study was the economic sustainability. Uh, the economic sustainability is basically the way we calculate this was measurement of financial input and outputs from the desalination process. Basically sources of funding and the distribution of economic benefits. Now, the most important part of this is, remember there is a, there are two groups that are involved in uh, Baja California. There is the, uh, the agribusinesses that are basically gaining economic um, benefits from this process. They're, uh, they're depleting these groundwaters, using a lot of electricity, um, producing agricultural products, and then sending it uh, as an export to other countries, especially US, uh, to use it. And then there's also the uh, the farm workers that are there and they actually, the economic benefit to them is quite different in this process because they get paid a specific amount of, you know, the average um, daily rate. And um, they just recently had a, um, um, just as a side note, um, the, um, the strike and they uh, managed to increase their daily rate, but still the daily um um, sort of hourly rates for their um, labor and uh, these laborers now like gain a little bit more, but still quite uh, subpar to um, the economic gains from the agricultural products, agricultural practices. Okay, so hold on. Okay, so let's talk about economic sustainability. Basically, the private, which means the agribusiness, the cost of pro cost of um, uh, service is about 23 million for the capital cost of building a desalination plant or the, all those desalination plants. And the benefit and the cost of um, uh, building a desalination plant. Okay, so actually, I'm going to put a pause here for one second. Um, the labor community that is in the Baja California region in the San Quentin Valley, they basically, they used to be these temporary laborers that would come in and um, do the work and then move uh, back uh, during the low season and then come back again during the high season. Now these agribusinesses are running all year long, uh, most of the day actually, as I said, 21 hours of running the desalination plant. So these are like long hours. And um, 
there are permanent population of these um, agricultural workers in the area. And uh, these people actually, unfortunately, have no access to um, um, sanitation. Some of them do not even have the piped water, and, and that's a big problem. And the water that comes out of the taps are not necessarily that clean. And the cost of, um, and some of them have to buy water from the tr uh, trucks that comes through, uh, or tankers that come through um, to be able to drink and use it for their essential need, um, which is still below the, um, the, the amount of water that's required for per person per day based on United Nations. They basically have to buy about 30, gal 30 gallon per person per day. I mean, sorry, the amount that they buy a month would average on 30 gallon per person per day. The, av the average for based on United Nations for essential needs about 50 to 100 gallon per person per day. So this cost of getting bought water from the tankers is quite high. Um, for these communities that are on, a, uh, on an hourly rate. Um, there is a discussion about building a desalination plant for, the, for these communities. The cost, the capital cost of building that desalination plant for the public um, uh, or the laborers for the region is about $48 million. And that is quite significant because um, um, Currently, without accounting for that extra cost for infrastructure of 48 million, um, uh, these people are paying between two to five percent of their income um, for access to access water. And um, again, based on United Nations um, um, estimate, that number should not increase more than three percent of uh, one's income. And um, if these desalination plants uh, gets built for these public um, uh, for the public uh, consumption, that is going to impact the water rates in the region, which can be quite significant. Okay, so agricultural revenue, um, it's about 142 million uh, annually. Uh, and then um, the basic average daily wage for these, um, um, for these labor is about seven to $9 per day, PD paid per day. Um, so think about like, the cost of providing um, you know, um, access to water for these two groups, the private agribusiness public and the revenue and the benefits they're achieving from this process. The third part of this is the social sustainability piece. Um, the basically how we can meet the social needs of basically access to employment, access to water, and making sure um, these are met, or actually are they being undermined because of the way we, we uh, work. Um, as I just mentioned, basically the population in the 1990s was about 50, this is the labor population, about 15,000 people. That population has grown to by 2010 to 42,000. And these are, again, these 42,000 is permanent um, uh, population. Now the laborers have moved to the region and they're staying there um, with their families. Um, there is, uh, uh, you know, and they lack actually, as I said, access to water, sanitation, education. Um, uh, when you look at this region, actually, um, a lot of these people who live in that region in the San Quentin Valley, while they contribute to the economy and provide services to all of us, even in the US, they don't, they actually are um, part of the um, uh, uh, sort of collectively uh, represent a big part of um, Mexico's uh, population that is under poverty and don't have access to education or water or services. Um, just to put some numbers next to what I said earlier with the water, uh, about 66% of the homes are without drainage or sanitation infrastructure, uh, which is quite significant. And the 22% 20, 20, of the homes don't have piped um, water supply. And this is while these desalination plants are going on, these 54 private desalination plants on site to, for, um, to water uh, the products that are available. Some concluding remarks, um, you know, one may ask, how did you get here? Um, as I said, in the 30s, 
there was some agriculture there, not that successful. By the time in the around 70s, when they started exporting their products, um, the cost benefit analysis for the region started working because it was worth to invest in infrastructure, as I said, fertilizers and uh, and uh, drip irrigation to make agricultural activity work there. The labor was cheaper, the land was cheaper, and there's less environmental regulation, so it was easier to do to to work there. Uh, by the 90s, that between the 70s and 90s, uh, before the desalination was introduced, there was a lot of um, groundwater overdraft happened within those 20 years. So the seawater intrusion was real. The, the productivity of the lands was going down because of the sal um, salinity in the water. Um, so basically there was a lot of, um, uh, some of these agribusinesses packed and left and they were not able to continue on. And some basically went through, um, uh, you know, started deciding to do more efficiency, with their products or actually uh, trying to figure out how um, uh, use technologies such as desalination to make this work. As, um, um, as, as I mentioned, as, again, um, as you can see the, um, the red here, these are the social issues. Um, uh, you can see that, you know, the, um, we started getting a lack of uh, um, uh, water, um, access to water and clean uh, water. And also uh, one might say, so why desalination? Why not wastewater reuse or some kind of reuse activity? There was lack of technical capacity. And also, um, uh, if you remember, I said 66% of the region doesn't have access to drainage. And also the agricultural uh, process is not necessarily collecting a lot of drainage. So lack of wastewater supplies uh, limited some of the efforts around um, wastewater reuse. Um, again, the desalination process, um, and also as you, as I mentioned, the, um, the laborers actually moved to the region permanently, and the public-private partnerships actually started being helpful to provide financial resources for te and technical capacity um, to build some desalination solution solutions. But again, the problem is. Um, um, it's not necessarily um, cost effective considering the consumer of that good when it comes to desalination for the population, uh, for the laborers population. On the private, private desalination plants, basically uh, one would say, how could 54 individual desalination plants could go in, play, in place um, so easily and be operating 21 hours a day to, for agricultural practices? And it, and they do actually have the environmental impact um, process. However, it's very, very easy to get a permit and get the environmental impact um, report done and obtained. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the, there's the electricity tariff that subsidizes, subsidizes cost of energy, which means that these people can uh, access a lot of energy at low cost. And also there's not much of a uh, problem with, um, uh, there's no, cost associated with the environmental impact of anything that's going on in these agricultural farms um, and, uh, and within their practices. So it's very easy for them to continue on. Um, sustainability outcomes and feedback loops are very, very important. The reason, again, this was the way we try to build this is it is sort of like a macro macrocosm of um, water, energy, food, sort of touching at the same points, right? So desalination, agricultural production, water use, and it's constantly feeding back. When you're thinking about the environmental issue, aquifer depletion and degradation and high CO2 emissions has a lot of environmental impact. That is also leading to social impacts because, because of the aquifer depletion and this uh, degradation of the water quality, the people who live in that region cannot access wa high quality water for their drinking, so the population doesn't have access to clean water, and um, also the population growth because of the actions of the economic benefits have been have increased the demand for water while they don't have it. And um, then also the economic piece of it is, you know, obviously agricultural industry um, has expanded its footprint in the region, and uh, and that expansion has been fueled by desalination activities, which is providing short-term solution 
um, to the problem and some long-term environmental impacts that are not being accounted for right now. And uh, basically also this creation of low wage agricultural jobs is feeding into some of the more, some more social um, uh, issues and injustice in the process, and then also feeding into the environmental footprint. So um, uh, what we can see here is this sort of like a, um, a, the feedback process that is going from environment to economics, uh, from going from economics to environment to social, and it keep going around and around. And um, it is interesting to also see that um, when it comes to the agricultural activities, there is enough money in the process, it still is it's beneficial for them to have these desalination uh, well, um, uh, technologies to be installed. Um, obviously, there is um, uh, the net um, profit from the process is still um, is significant enough for them to be able to justify the fact that they're desalinating groundwater. However, at the same time, the population that's fueling that process or helping to make it happen do not does not have access to. Um, to public infrastructure in, a, um, in an equitable way. Um, just to wrap it up, um, basically just some policy thoughts as we move forward. And it's again, while we focused on the San Quentin, I'm gonna re-emphasize the fact that this is again, is just one glimpse at what can happen in so many other regions. Water scarcity is real and with climate change, we are going to see more and more challenges with access to water or water availability. So every action that we are taking today can have long-term and lingering consequ environmental consequences and social consequences at the same time. So uh, we have to acknowledge and plan for potentials for desalination to identify basically these agricultural products and uh, basically the fact that it's driving this labor demand and labor-based migration, because how long more can we continue on desalinating water? And is this intensified agriculture uh, or activities um, are not necessarily sustainable in the long term? Um, actively, but we have to actively consider trade-offs across the water, food, energy nexus. We can't just look at one and try to focus on one because it, it you know, for example, this area had been trying to deal with water availability as one only highlighted issue. However, it's having both energy impacts, food impacts and social impacts at the same time. So using desalination particularly where uh, sort of um, creates this virtual water transfer to other countries, to the US for example, while it's having so many environmental justice implications at the same time. And then, uh, practice integrated, basically, we have to practice more integrated water and energy resource planning process. For example, um, you know, the, um, the easily accessed environmental um, uh, review process or the fact that people can dig more wells, the fact that they can desalinate as much water as they want, the fact that energy is, um, is so cheap and easily um, um, you know, accessible through the grid uh, for such low price. Uh, these are all having some local and um, uh, issues and ca causing some local issues and long-term lingering issues. So uh, creating more better transparency, helping understand how trade policies are impacting these activities, all are very important. Therefore, it's really, really, again, very important to have across the board policies that water that thinks about energy, energy that thinks about water, food that thinks about both energy and water, and sort of moving beyond these short-term benefits for long-term impacts. And with that, I just wanna acknowledge my um, co-authors, which I had their name at the beginning of this um, uh, presentation. And um, this was a labor of love, a lot of work went into it. The whole um, survey process was, uh, was quite intensive and was very difficult to do. Uh, you can imagine a lot of that, um, people were not that enthusiastic to talk to us. So uh, we had to, as I said, collect tons of publicly available water, privately available water and the survey and sort of putting all these pieces of puzzle together. So a, a lot of work and I wanna acknowledge my co-authors, especially Gemma Smith who put a lot of time into this. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you, Nusha. Um, we really appreciate you sharing this very complicated story with us. <laughs> um, so we have some questions, of sure. course, that are coming through the chat right now, but I'd like to start with kind of a, a big picture uh, question, which is, um, are there, so this is so complicated, right? So are there models that you know of where um, people, communities, groups, regions are addressing water quality in ways that actually achieves the, the goals of the triple bottom line approach? That's a great question. So unfortunately, the one of the biggest problems we are facing in this is the, is the fact that anytime you put a lot of, if there is no consistent regulation across different borders, across different regions, what you see is if you put more stricter water quality uh, restrictions, we have some in California, for example, um, people can pack their bags and go and start doing things other places. If you have caught, you know, very specific labor laws, the same thing. So it's, some of one one way to sort of deal with this is actually through these trade um, policies that we put in place because they, in a way, they help to um, highlight the importance of wherever whatever footprint we are having in other regions. But the reality is, look, even in California, um, it's this is not a San Quentin problem. Even in California, we, our labor community um, that works in agriculture, a lot of them do not have access to clean water due to, um, um, you know, uh, polluted wells or, you know, some of the issues around um, various agricultural activities. And some of them actually, because of groundwater overdraft, their wells have gone dry. So, um, so it is not a San Quentin problem. And I didn't, uh, one of the reasons I emphasized this at the beginning too, we are not trying to say, oh my God, this is happening there because that's what's bad. But the reality is you can actually take that spotlight and put it in other regions and find other problems. So um, the reality is we have to be better at the way we use our resources and be more mindful. And, um, and source. I always say source protection is the first step to having access to clean water. And that's key here. So thank you. So that brings me to a much more technical question, actually, um, sure. which is which Audrey asked, and that is, how is water desalinated? What? <laughs> this is a question I've wondered for a long time. Yes. So basically, it depends on different models that you can desalinate water. Generally speaking, you basically pull the water out, push it through membranes. So think about a cloth. Okay, just, just to give you a simple way. And then you basically push the, the, and that's why you use a lot of energy. One is for the extraction, one is to push it through because for example, pushing water through a cloth requires a lot of energy because it has, it's, um, you don't have a lot of, um, you know, the grids are very, 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 very minuscule. So they, it's very hard. So then by the time the water comes out the other side of your membrane, which, which is sort of like the, in this story is a cloth. Um, it basically all those um, things that like from salt to other minerals to anything that was in the water, it sort of gets stays behind. And the, that what comes out is basically water with nothing in it. Um, it's basically H2O, H2O. Um, so um, th this process is very costly. There's another way, basically, it's uh, using heat, uh, which is something probably all of us have learned in our, um, you know, grade school physics. You basically um, heat up the water, they, it turns into a vapor, and then you condensate it, and that water that comes down the other side it doesn't, you know, all the, everything is left behind through the condensation process. Um, these are two ways of desalinating um, water. There, there are a couple more, but these, like the major ones that you hear about is the, we call that reverse osmosis, the one that's going through the membrane and, um, and the, the other one that's through heat is thermal desalination. Um, so, well, and Bonnie had a, a follow-up question to that, which is what happens um, in the reverse osmosis version? What happens to all the, the brine or great whatever question. it is that, that's left over? Where does that go? Yes, great question. Um, 
it depends. Uh, sometimes you have regulations, sometimes you don't. Uh, some, uh, in some areas, they actually re-inject it back to the groundwater or they actually uh, dump it out in the ocean. Uh, sometimes there are evaporation ponds that they put this brine in them and they have to and let it evaporate. So basically the minerals and everything that was in the water stays behind and the water evaporates. So basically you create a uh, area that's um, uh, with the brine deposit. Um, depending on what regulations we have, different one of these practices are being uh, exercised. So for example, um, in California, what happens to the brine is then you have to take more water to mix it with the brine to be able to put it back in the environment. And the way you put it back in the environment is you have to actually have these diffusers that goes deep in the ocean and spread these brine, sort of mixed up dry brine, diffuse it to make sure you're not having some aquatic impacts. Now, this is in California. We have a lot stranger uh, um, uh, environmental regulations. Some regions don't have as much of a, a you know, strict <laughs> environmental regulations, so they can just dump it out. So it, it just depends where you are, but absolutely true that the product that leaves behind, that's left behind is by itself is a problem. Well, and I, I'm, I am also now understanding that the energy use is like, it's on both ends of, of this solution, yes. right? So <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's every part of this process, wow. which is crazy. And also another crazy thing is, remember those membranes I mentioned to you, they have to be washed to get all, everything out because they are so dense. If you don't wash them, they get clogged, right? So that process uses water too. So just um, energy and water all over it. That's why honestly, um, there are very few regions in the world that desalination makes sense for agricultural practices because it is a costly process. It costs about $2,000 to $2,500 per acre foot to desalinate water in California, considering the infrastructure and you know meeting all the regulations and all the energy that gets used, that's a lot. That's a that costs a lot. That's a lot of money for an acre foot of water that then would be used for agriculture and then done, right? So, so wow, this I, my mind is just exploding, and no wonder you study these things. This is fascinating <laughs> and terrifying. Um, so another question here uh, from Nock, who thanks you for a fascinating presentation and asks about the tariff that allows for desalination to be a viable economic option for agribusiness. How did that come to be? And was that the result of a trade agreement? Yeah, so the tariff is actually not just for agribusiness. It just, it's for businesses. They have this tariff, um, um, tariff 90, uh, tariff 90. And I'm happy to send you the paper. It has a lot more details in it, but it actually went in place. It wasn't meant for agriculture, but everybody can use it, whoever is, has a business. So they're taking advantage of it. And um, no, it was not part of the trade agreement. It was just something that was put in place um, to promote uh, business activities in Mexico. Okay. Um, another question that these are kind of bouncing around, but there, um, there are a lot of really great questions here. Also from Bonnie, is there some kind of pressure that consumers can put on, she wrote the industry, but I, I'm now understanding there are multiple industries involved here. So like, is there consumer pressure via buying power that can affect any part of this <laughs> massive web? Absolutely. Look, um, we are the driver of every action that we see. The reality is, unless we buy these things, right, and nobody's going to make them. Uh, just think about every single consumption you have on a daily basis. Do you really need to have strawberries when they're not in season? Probably not. Um, you know, it's important to grow locally, use locally, right? These are all very, very important issues. Reducing waste is quite important. You know, how much of the things that we use are wasted and thrown away? I mean, another question is, I mean, in the, and I'm sure these farms are subject to the same thing, but you know, the way we buy things, 
they have to meet certain standards. So if the strawberry is not this big or it does, if it has two scratches, they're thrown away. So we are using all this water and energy and labor to not even make that thing being the thing at um, uh, sort of the, the daytime uh, so, um, or daylight. So the key here is we as consumers need to be a lot more thoughtful of what we are using, what we are consuming, when we are consuming it, where we are buying it, where, is our, where are our products coming from? And it is interesting, just wanna highlight something important, is that if you go to the labor community down in um, San Quentin, they might be quite happy that they have a job, right? You have to think about like, what are the, yes, so it's, it sounds terrible, but there is something in there probably that those people are moving to take these jobs because they want to work. So like, how are we going to create a sustainable job stream like, or kind of like labor um, um, to market for these people in case we are not buying those products to make sure they are not, they are not going to experience more poverty that they are right now doing. So it's a very complex process, but I think we as customers or consumers have a lot of power and for sure, what we eat, when we eat it, and how we can reduce our waste is key in this process. Excellent, thank you. And to build on that, Barbara asked whether economists estimate the increase in food costs if workers had just wage and living conditions. Do we, like, do we know what that would look like? No. Uh, I mean, we can estimate. But the reality is that's not what goes into these discussions, right? Um, I think one thing that they didn't respond, that I didn't say earlier, which is actually important to highlight here is how much we are willing to pay for things, right? Uh, the willingness to pay highlights the importance of that, that matter to us. And uh, if we are constantly buying cheap things, obviously the agribusiness are not, is not going to cut their uh, profit margin and then eventually the um, the consumers the laborers are not going to benefit from that so it's a um we don't really account for social and environmental impacts within our our cost benefit analysis right when it comes to desalination the cost benefit analysis is every unit of desal is producing this many this many pounds of this product and that, and I can sell it for this much. So the math works out perfect, right? So it, like looking in the, at the scheme of agriculture here, um, it, there are a couple of questions along the lines of agriculture and, and salinization. So sure. Brian asked how much of the world agricultural processes are dependent on aquifer water usage and salinization impacts? Do you know the um, A lot of it, actually, um, especially in dry areas, a significant amount of agriculture depends on um, groundwater. Um, some of this has been going on for centuries, and you know, as long as it's sustainable, it works. The problem is intensified agriculture, which you want to grow more in a shorter time. And, uh, you know, and um, gain as much as you can within a very short window of time. And that's when the whole problem starts, um, start sort of getting um, um, sort of highlighted. Um, a lot of India uses groundwater, a lot of Pakistan uses groundwater, Iran uses groundwater, or Central Valley of California, you know, we, uh, just, to, just to give you some sort of like a very important piece that is, it's, I, I, I think it's important for people to know, before we started building all this infrastructure in California, we did have agriculture in uh, Central Valley, but they all depended on groundwater and the groundwater depletion started causing these subsidence, which means the land start going down. And, um, and um, then we built all these infrastructure to, to prevent uh, people using groundwater to deal with the groundwater overdraft. And what happened was that 
surface water that we brought in from the infrastructure just created more agriculture and the dependent on groundwater never got eliminated, right? So this regulation over how much groundwater is being used and for what is really, really key. Uh, data and information is very key, right? For us to get to do this work, we had to jump a lot of hoops to get the information, right? If you don't have data and transparency, it's very difficult to know how sustainable we are in everything that we do. Do you, do you have ongoing um, relationships with, so you mentioned how this was just this massive project and, um, and I would also imagine that it took time for you to build kind of some trusting relationships along the way. So are you, I'm kind of curious as a researcher, how do you sustain those relationships? How do you view your responsibility in terms of those relationships? Yeah, actually that's a great question. Um, the, the original, originally we started working with Baja California on some of the water energy issues um, in the border area. And, um, and that was, we, then we started collaborating with COLAF, which is a university down there. And um, we started sort of co-hosting events and, um, uh, had, you know, we had a visiting scholar with us for about a year who actually we led to another paper we have on water energy nexus, which focuses on the energy that's, uh, ex uh, sorry, the, yes, energy, uh, natural gas that's extracted in Texas and New Mexico, and then moved to uh, the border region to be uh, processed and uh, turned into energy and then brought to California to be consumed. So it is, you know, we have a very tight relationship with, the, with that border region, a lot of different activities going on. Um, uh, and uh, they are part of so many different supply chains for us. Uh, so we were very interested to see how some of these rules and regulations we have, for example, clean energy or this and that, um, or how, is, how are they having sort of a spillover effect on, in that region, um, positive or negative. Um, so that's how this relationship came about and sort of led into some of this collaboration. In one of those events we were having, I had a colleague, um, who, my, who is my Lizette, who is a co-author of this paper, she presented on some of the activities in San Quentin and all the agricultural products. And then she said, oh, they're using desalination. So I came back and I'm thinking, this cannot be sustainable. We have to go look into this. So that's how that piece of the research came about uh, like this. And um, it took a long time. It took about a year and a half before we were able to sort of like put all these pieces together and get to the point that we had a solid piece of work. So it takes time and energy and lots of effort to maintain its communication is not easy. Data is not easy. My student actually who worked on this uh, paper, Gemma, she is a bilingual, so she spoke Spanish. So that really helped. I don't think if I, I don't speak the Spanish the language, so I would be, I would not be as useful in the process if it wasn't for her and her, um, uh, you know, capacity to communicate um, and the students who went down and collected the data, it was key to have locals to be there. Thank you. Um, Kaylin actually asked a, a question that came up kind of as you were just responding to that last question. What kind of energy do they use to power these plants in, in Baja specifically? Is there any kind of um, renewable energy that's being used there? No, so they depend on grid. Remember, because of the tariff, it's cheaper for them to get the water energy out of the grid. So they whatever, whatever mix is in the grid, that's what they use. And a lot of these numbers that I presented, just because there was a limited time, so I didn't go into too much detail, is that we basically calculated the CO2 emission of the grid based on the reports that they had. And then we basically said, if you're running these desalination plants for 21 hours and it uses this much energy per, you know, um, per gallon of water or like an acre of water that they're pulling out. So how much do we, or per hour that they're operating, how much um, CO2 emissions would they cost? So the, it just depends on the, depends on what is in the grid at the point, at that point in time. Got it. Um, okay, so one last question, uh, just to kind of wrap things up here. And um, I am vamping on a question that Geta added. Um, so, 
there are all of these various decision makers um, involved it, just in this example that you've provided us with today. And of course right. the decision makers vary based on the place, right? So, right. Um, so given that, you know, how, um, how do we invent was the word she used in her question, um, new ways to craft the solutions that um, right. that are necessary for this. I mean, you mentioned before the planning is really critical. Are there other right. aspects of this or would you like to go into that a little bit more deeply from the decision maker perspective? Sure. Look, I think the problem we are facing is that we have these silos. We have silos that deal with water supply, silos that deal with water quality, silos that deal with energy uh, or trade, right? And they don't necessarily talk to each other. There's no, my, my sole job is to focus on quantity of water. So I don't care what happens in the energy because that's not my job to think about, right? So, and, and one of the things we wanted to demonstrate through this process is actually it is because whatever decision is made in the energy sector eventually has a spillover effect in the water sector or whatever decision we make in the food sector ultimately will impact water and energy. And we have talked about this a lot in California, but this is also another demonstration. You know, we often don't have la good land use laws or regulations. Um, people, you know, they buy a land, they start growing things. We don't tell them what they can grow and what is sustainable for them to grow. We don't think about water and energy when it comes to that, right? So um, these disconnects are causing um, ultimately a lot of long-term sustainability problems for us. And again, while I didn't touch on climate change here, it is very much of a present problem because it is causing a lot of other problems, right? It's hotter, so we have to water these plants more. They, um, you know, the evaporation or evapotranspiration is higher or people need water. So it's just like, it is a constant issue. So we have to think about, I think one of the demonstrations we had here is like the policies cannot be one singular policy. We have to think across sectors. We have to collaborate across sector and we have to have integrated decision-making process. And for example, one way to do it, as I mentioned earlier, is true for, for, through the trade process, right? You can say, we have certain water and energy regulations that we would like everybody to follow if we are going to have this trade, right? Um, or, you know, taxing uh, environmental impacts, right? Um, across the board, um, in a way, making people think about, okay, what is it that they're doing and how it's impacting it? One last thing I would say is, um, we often, when we, think, we talk about energy and dealing with climate change, we often think about energy and technologies that would capture CO2, do this, do that, do this, then we can do whatever we want the same way that we have done it for a long, long time. But the reality is water in so many different ways is, a, is an integral part of what's happening in climate change and energy because we every source of water that we look at is much more energy intensive than the other one that we had before. So we have to be very mindful of how certain decisions we are making is impacting our CO2 emission and, um, and the uh, environmental footprints. That is a, a very good note for us to end on today. So thank you so much, Dr. Nusha Ajami for sharing your time with us and, uh, and your, your work. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in today. We are really glad that you would join us. We hope that you will join us for the remainder of the week's lectures. Um, all of them will be taking place at the same time, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can register at metcalfinstitute.org if you haven't already. And we look forward to hearing a lot more really um, important ideas this week. Until then, thank you again, Dr. Jami, and have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. It was wonderful.